imagine you're a space mining professional and you need to identify potential landing sites and mineable locations to plan your long-term investment strategy. How would you do that today? Now imagine that NASA needs to identify safe traverses for the astronauts to drive their moon buggies along. Even if they could specify candidate locations, there's no definitive map of lunar routes that serves as a global reference today. I'm Megan Eske and I had a multi-decade career at NASA. I'm one of Analytica's top 100 GovTech influencers. More recently, I've defined a planetary address framework based on quadrangles and low slope routes. I've named and located 32 inaugural roads on the moon and Mars, and have defined a new area of research called space robotics. My business partner is Paul Tice of Fior Innovations. Paul is the CEO of an Oregon-based mapping company and the co-creator of the first lunar map of the first roads in space. Maps of the moon are hard, hard to navigate with an abundance of craters and few other obvious landmarks. Although the lunar rovers came equipped with sophisticated navigation technology, the astronauts became disoriented when they were over the horizon and preferred to follow their own rover tracks back to the base. With no atmosphere on the moon, it's hard to judge distances and everything appears to be much closer. At Reliquence, we provide a platform for, for clients to hire cartographers and commission maps um, based on a global standard for nomenclature. Uh, think about a syntax of um, an Earth-based address. It has a particular structure including roads, cities, states, zip codes, etc. Every something that we're all familiar with. On the Moon and on Mars, none of those things exist, but there are cartographic elements called quadrangles. And some of the quadrangles have names, and some of the quadrangles have uh, numbers. And so I just use the name quadrangles in the place of the cities and states, and I use the numerical quadrangles in place of zip codes to come up with a very simple, intuitive planetary address framework that would be recognizable all over the world. Our product is a two-sided marketplace that allows cartographers to register and turn their map making skills into a business. We provide the marketing operations and payments all in exchange for percentage of the transactions. This is our first attempt at mapping the first roads in space. You'll see over here the three flyouts represent the roads and we chose the iridescent blue, green and yellow to represent light, which is one of the key enablers for life beyond Earth. Over on the left, you see the ESCII system, which has been defined, and beside each of the flyouts, you see an address, and then you see some justification for why we chose that location. Up at the top, you see a blank space, and that's for our clients to add their logos and give them out as promotional giveaways. To get started, we're targeting brands in the tourism, mining, entertainment, and construction verticals. Um, our IP is our data, our maps, the planetary address framework. And here you see we're trying to move from this very slow one map at a time model towards scaled map generation. And um, what we would do then is allow our clients to have shared copyright to the maps. And this is um, a view from space of the Apollo 17 landing site. Apollo 17 was the last time we had men on the moon. And interestingly, you can see the rover tracks are still exactly as they were 50 years ago. Nothing has changed because there's no wind, there's no atmosphere on the moon, so the rover tracks last forever. In doing my due diligence, I had to go back and see who else has been working on roads. If I'm going to claim first roads in space, what else has been done? The only thing that I could find um, were companies who had some kind of technology that they were trying to put forward to pave the roads. And we, I basically had to reject that model because if we're going to do a complete map, we really don't need paved roads. And the rovers are, you know, off-road vehicles. They can go anywhere. They don't need paved surfaces. So instead, I just, just determined that we would probably be best suited with autonomous road bots and really just leaving behind the rover tracks and calling those roads. So this was my first customer validation moment. This is... Um, 
the traverses, the three traverses from Apollo 15, which was the first time they had a rover um, up on the moon. And you'll see that the longest traverse is a straight line, while the other two traverses are loops. And that's because down there in Spur, um, Spur Crater, uh, Commander Dave Scott and Jim Irwin were over the horizon and they got confused, they got disoriented, they couldn't see the lunar module and so they just followed their rover tracks back and there's a really great thing at the end of, they, they interviewed them after the mission and said, you know what, in spite of all that technology, we prefer the old Hansel and Gretel trick. So this was really cool. <laughs> Um, so, what is a lunar roadbot? Well, you know, we have autonomous rovers, although nobody's thinking about using them to make roads. Um, one of the things for sure, we need to make them go fast. So we need to optimize our roadbots for speed. And most of the autonomous roadbots today are very slow. They're stop and go, collect a sample, stop and go. They're just trying to last as long as they can. But they're not in a big hurry. So I did find one company that is optimizing their autonomous rover for speed, and it's called GMV, and they're doing this for, for the European Space Agency. Oh, I'm done? Oh, wow. 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds? Okay. So moving on, um, the end game. So now we have the maps. We have people from all over the world who have contributed the maps. Imagine what are we going to do with them? We're going to go make those roads. And there's really two approaches. One is to invest in um, a, a fleet of road bots and then have the space agencies hire us to do it, or Uber space, which is basically a coordinate, you know, a platform for coordinating that all over the world. Um, here's how you can reach me, and I just wanted to point out that I have some maps for everybody, so please help yourself to the first lunar map of the first roads in space. And we're looking for customers to commission the first Mars map of the first roads in space. Thank you. I'm going to call back up our previous three speakers, so the Embry-Riddle team as well as uh, Andrew Bond, and we will take questions from the audience, and uh, ladies, don't get nervous, but your advisor has raised his hand, so you're in the hot seat. Dr. Seathouse, kick us off. Well, Andrew, uh -oh. Uh, I find that, oh, thank you very much, um, even on Earth, um, you, you, you can build one piece of equipment that does everything. You can build one piece of equipment that's specialized. The balance is usually somewhere in between. And a trailer, being a European, is an excellent solution to many. So you have a dedicated piece of equipment for excavating, lifting, and placing. And then the trailers are for transportation, um, for bagging, etc. And they can be specialized. So I love straw bales. I was actually going to picture, put a, picture, a video up of a straw baler going across a field and saying that's the goal. Um, yes, and that is part of where the uh, impetus for this came from, that and large masonry blocks. Um, secondary structures, yes, that is how NASA originally did it. They had a steel formwork uh, with sandbags on top, uh, but they wanted to remove it. There were some issues there. Uh, I am really trying to keep it simple so that if it does fail, it fails softly, um, as my bags have done today. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there so others can get questions. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So, um, like we mentioned before, we're trying. Our concept is to combine the two technologies. So, the inflatable layerings would be on the outside of the shelter, and then the water walls would be on the inside layering. And one thing that uh, we kind of touched on was that it can be customizable. So, uh, the water walls can also double as a life support system, and they can be. Um, 
they can, so if you decide to use them as a live support system, it could be integrated multifunctionally or you can have them separate so that um, the water bags can be either like launched separately or things like that. Um, so that would be, you want to say something? Okay. So that would be like the, the innovative part is that combining the two to try to mitigate um, the two. Sorry. And I would just add that it um, allows us to have the uh, significant advantage of having a low mass travel into space uh, comparing to metallic structures because inflatable habitats along with water membranes are lighter significantly than all the other available shielding uh, technologies nowadays. Uh, so, uh, paying customers are really anybody who wants to commission a map. And so, we started with the idea that it's probably good for space mining. So, space miners would like to p potentially carve out sort of a safety zone with their roads. But, you know, a road is a very fundamental and ubiquitous concept. And so, theoretically, if we're making these maps, we're going to have, you know, um, high net worth individuals who want to contribute to making the maps. We're going to have potentially the road maps integrated in with games and simulations. I mean, I don't really want to limit myself, but I do want to start, I think, with the space brands who actually want to use the maps in some capacity, whether that's terrestrial here on Earth in a game or a simulation, or actually to go up and mine the moon.